Good afternoon, and um, somebody over here very cheekily shouted, nice shirt, and uh, that is true, it is a nice shirt. Uh, and for those of you who are observant, it's a South African nice shirt. <laughs> it is, a, it is a modeled on the kind of shirt that Nelson Mandela used to love to buy. So I thought I have two choices this afternoon. I could come looking like a British, a British lord who's a bit stiff in a suit, or I could wear my character literally on my sleeves. How about that? Now, you are all at the uh, beginning of a great adventure, uh, because you're here in the year in which you'll find out whether or not we actually manage to maneuver ourselves through the intractable spaghetti of the European Union and find a life beyond. And that may be something of the memory of which you go back with your year here in wherever city you choose to be in the UK from this particular time of year right the way through to the next year. But that's in a way not really important. What is important is what you're gonna do with the quality, I hope quality, of education and direction and insight that you gain over the next 12 months. And part of that, you know it better than me, are the networks that you will develop, the relationships that you'll take on board, the culture you will experience. I remember speaking joyfully at the goodbye event for the Chevening Fellows in July of this year, and there was a wonderful girl from Jamaica who received an award There they are. See, Jimmy, I can is over there. I say hello, you. <laughs> I can speak Patois like you, you know. Because <laughs> I was brought up in Jamaica part of the time. <laughs> oh boy, they're all going crazy. And um, just to make sure, just to give the other nations. So my father was from Angola. <laughs> uh, his his parents were from India. My, my, my mother was half Panamanian <laughs> and the other half Ghanaian. Oh, no. And I was born in England. <laughs> oh, you are an odd bunch. <laughs> You're lovely. But I remember this uh, great Jamaican girl in the summer, giving her story of what she had learned about her year studying in the UK. And the thing that had fascinated her the most as an active volunteer was discovering that there are 600 castles up and down the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. And she had aimed to visit as many as possible in that year. And her next life's journey was to visit all the rest of them. And I thought, what a fascinating thing for a girl from Jamaica to long to do is to visit English, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish castles. But at least it gives you a sense of the difference of what the traditions and history and culture and dynamics of what the UK have been all about. This is an interesting point in all of our histories. At this moment in time, many nations are beginning to do an entrenchment backwards. They're beginning to look hard at what used to be the identity of single nations. And of single nations beginning to say, what can we recover of that nation identity to make America great again, or get the great back into Great Britain, or to make sure that whether it's for the Austrians or even for the Germans, let's make sure that the distinctiveness of our own identities is protected. This flies in the face of the globalization of which you are radically a demonstration of. It flies in the face of the interconnected communication that we all have with each other. The fact that any one of you sitting here knowing anyone else's number through your own system, whether you've brought your phone from Argentina or you've brought your phone from Paraguay. So I, I'm not gonna get through all 140 nations in the course. <laughs> I'll have a good go. 
But wherever you happen to be, you could message one another and it bounces through a system somewhere else and comes down to somebody else here and all of a sudden you've made instantaneous communication. My generation could never have done that. So we've become used to a global conversation, a global expectation, a global pursuit. And we've also become used to a boundaryless world. But politically, people in communities that don't share, if I can be as candid, your insights, perspectives and pursuits, people who are frightened by what they feel they've lost, what they feel has been taken from them, are treading backwards. And in the age of great innovation and automation, that is a retrenchment we must resist. And you must resist. So you have a year in which you can become better ambassadors for your country, your culture, your own selves, your language, your literature, but your identities. And you can take on the fight to keep the world open and progressive and a place that serves the interests of every generation to think way beyond one place, one corner, one type of food. I mean, after all, you'll find the finest British food called chicken tikka masala. And while you're here, you must enjoy it because we've taken in, and if you get a moment, please go to the cinema in the next week and watch Victoria and Abdul. It is definitely worth the site of 112 minutes. It tells the remarkable story of that amazing queen of the empire, whatever you feel about it, but were it not for it, you wouldn't be here, but tells the story, so be grateful, and, and of how, <laughs> and how she chose to absorb a culture alien to the British mindset of the time. One thing to think of it as a nation for subjection and control, another thing to absorb the culture of India and to treasure its flavors and its thinking and its ideology and its religion and to get to grips with becoming a global thinker. If she could do it then, we must do it more now. So in this period of great innovation, in this period where we're surprised every day by something new that we never thought of before, I was reminding a group of students from Southampton University this morning that I'm part of the generation of people who in the cold days of winter if we had a car and we wanted to start it we had to pull a thing called a choke. Now all the old people who are sitting here on the front will remember things called chokes. You used to chug this thing out of the front of the car and if you chugged it out long enough and then the engine might turn over. And now we have cars that stop at every traffic light because the engine system automatically switches off to protect the fuel and then it restarts the minute you touch the accelerator. We've become used now to playing with innovation. And I want to give you a little insight into what's coming next because now as you're here in Europe for the next year and you're part of the European experience, Let's have a look at what European thinkers from Google are doing. Let's play this video. The Dutch cycle more than any other nation in the world, almost 900 kilometers per person. But that also means we have 350,000 bike-related injuries. Now imagine that we would make biking safer, smarter and easier by applying self-driving technology to biking. We taught our self-driving bike to figure out where it is, what's around it, what will happen next, and what it should do. We leaned on Google's expertise in self-driving cars, but we had to adapt the technology to work on a bike. We decided to add two additional features. First, you can request the bike to pick you up wherever you are, and we developed a comfort mode, adjusting the pedals to a perfect resting position. I think the self-riding bike could really give a boost to the economy, because people could also work uh, on their bicycles. You work in your office, you work in your home, you work in your car. You could even work on your bike. 
I have so much more time. My kids love it. They're just free. They can go anywhere they want, anytime they want. It's amazing. At the Fitzgerald Bond, we feel that this is the biggest invention since the invention of the bicycle itself. At Google, we always put our users first. With the launch of this bike, we believe we do that again. <laughs> now, I hope you've um, got the little bit of British humour that's in there. Yes, it's an April Fool's joke. And you will be here through April the 1st, 2018. And an April Fool's joke is really something which is so wild from possibilities that we try to tease ourselves on one day a year, make fun of our stiffness. But take the spirit of the video. Take the thinking that comes from Google in reality, which is, you know something? If we can have automated cars, if we can even have automated trucks, if we can have automated planes, if we can have automated trains, can we not have automated bikes? It may sound weird, but it is possible. There was a period of time once when not one of us would have flown. It didn't exist. Isn't that long ago? If you think back, I know you can't, but the old people on the front with me can. You think back to uh, 1903, all right, I can't quite go back that far, but near. In 1903, not a single man or woman had ever flown. By 1912, when the Wright brothers had their second try in France at putting the aircraft together that crashed in the US, when the first time it flew for just nine seconds, and the second time for 90 seconds, the whole notion of flying was abandoned. And you all came here on planes. Things that other generations said were impossible. They become possible. I don't know if you've seen the great uh, man who's manufactured the Tesla car the all-electric great luxury vehicle. Elon Musk has said his next innovation is to fly us by rocket from given locations to anywhere on the planet within 30 minutes. How will he do that? <laughs> Reusable rockets. We laugh at it. You might go home in one. The possibilities of how we think about what are the options in front of us are compelling. Now, one of the privileges of my life every year is to go to the World Economic Forum in Davos. That is meant to be the place of the greatest superior business, academic, and political intellects. They forgot about you. You're far better and brighter. But those three and a half thousand who gather every year in Davos in Switzerland in minus 15 degrees temperatures with five feet of snow around them spend a few days structuring the world. And it was from the World Economic Forum two years ago that the term the fourth industrial revolution was created. Now you've come to the country where the industrial revolution began back in the late or the mid-1880s, the Industrial Revolution was born of that mix between steel and coal and power. And all of a sudden, things could be moved and products and machines came into existence. And now, if you order something from Amazon, it's highly likely the only human hand that has touched it is the postman or woman who puts it at your door. Because the machine collects it boxes it, sorts it, pushes it out, and only at the final step does a hand deliver it. So we're in the fourth industrial revolution. It's the age of the cyber everything. 
It is the age of the automated everything. It's the age of the computer and the robot. It's the age of digitalization. And you're coming here to learn, some of you, history, culture, arts, classics, languages. And there'll be those sitting in the great centers of the world's innovative thinking, thinking, why are you bothering to do that? Because the only things worth studying, surely, in the 2017s and 18s and 19s and beyond is how to make automated information technology systems structure the easy life we want. The automated bike. The banking system attached within your wrist. You don't have to carry a card anymore. You just beep as you walk out. I watched the video this week of the supermarkets which are being in place all over Europe and all across the US, where as you walk in, it does face recognition, matches it to a card identification. You pick up your products, you go out, it's billed you before you've got to the door. There's nobody at checkout anymore. In some ways, this represents progress. In other ways, it represents fear. Everything is without a person. So we just run by systems. And when we run by systems, we're allowing systems to determine what we favor. Well, the World Economic Forum produced an interesting article review on information technology, AI, digitalization, and the fourth industrial revolution. And I just want to read you two paragraphs on it to set you thinking. Typically in the past, it says, free markets have decided the fate of new innovation. And with time, local governments come in and intervene. Uber, it says, is banned in Japan uh, and London at the moment, but it's optional in India. However, in this case, such an approach would be disastrous. They write, we're not in favor of governments getting in the way of innovation. We're calling for a coherent global dialogue about ethics in the 21st century. The dialogue needs to move beyond academic journals and opinion journals to include government committees and international bodies such as the UN. There is a need for a structured international forum to form a list of technologies that need governance to evaluate each technology and to release a blueprint for a code of conduct on how to use it or if to use it at all. For example, an international governmental body could lay down specific rules, such as making it mandatory to, to release the logic behind certain AI algorithms. I'm going to get you to do something. If you have a phone, could you get it out? And just to show me if you have a phone, could you put the light on? So I can see. Ah, fantastic. Phones all over. This is like a pop concert, isn't it? I'm about to do a turn of a song, and then you can all wave. And we no, no, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> go on to your phones. I'm assuming if you don't have Wi-Fi, you've got 4G or 3G or something. Go on to your phones and go on to Google and just put in two words. Beautiful baby. Go on to images and have a look. Now, you're from 142 different countries. I can see many of you are of different colors. Some of you, I can see, are still evolving, and that's OK. Um, you'll get there by the end of the year. But you're very different in looks. See if you can find yourself. The guy said it. Say it again. All white. It's all white, which is not all right, is it? No. You see, you, many of you, some of you may already be parents, but you're certainly being children. I bet when you have your children, you'd like them on the list of beautiful babies because to you, whoever you have as a child is a beautiful baby. But guess what? 
somebody somewhere in the algorithmic logic of Google has decided that the image that represents beauty is blonde, white, and blue-eyed. You have to get to number 73 before you find a black baby. You have to push a little bit further down into the 80s before you find an Indian baby or an Asian. And then it gets a little bit more mixed beyond that. But if you're just a first viewer and you're looking for identifiable pictures of a beautiful baby, almost all of you don't fit. You see, this is the challenge of an unconstituted, not necessarily ethically driven, automated world of the future. Somebody somewhere in the mysterious silences unknown to most of us decides what works. And the algorithm is created and we must adapt. So here's the challenge to you and I. The World Economic Forum says that we need now, in the 21st century, a global code of conduct and ethics. Most universities have now begun to teach ethics, responsibility, citizenship. But in the years when I was younger, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, if you said ethics, somebody thought you were doing a theology program. They thought you were doing a psychology course. Because those things such as values and ethics were to be limited to the psycho areas, to the religious areas, to be outside of the innovative. But actually now in the fourth industrial revolution, we need the innovative ethics of the new century more than ever. Your big challenge in this next year is beyond getting a great master's education. It's beyond visiting all 660 castles in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's beyond answering the question, will the UK leave the European Union? I still think it's a question. It's beyond making sure that your home-going arrangements are so comfortable you slip from one to the other. Your task in the next year is to discover why you exist. And what will you do with the privileged assets you've attained? For in your year here, courtesy of the British taxpayer, of which I am one, we gift you this opportunity to galvanize learning with values to become valuable to go back home having sorted how you will shape life, not according to the algorithmic decisions of a few people in Palo Alto in California, not according to the technologies that will rule inside your pocket or your hand, not gripped and fascinated just by what innovation is around. It's fantastic that we have so much and more that we can't even begin to think of. But if your roots are not in values, real purposes, you will be as empty as the automated bike. I've been holding on to one edition of the New Scientist magazine for the last year. I urge you to Google it, find this edition. It is the edition of January 2017, 28th of January 2017. You may be able to see it if the camera captures it. The New Scientist, a journal of science, asks the question, the meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? And inside, the scientific journal begins to set out that actually discovering what the meaning of life is, what your purpose is, what your value is, is not just about giving yourself a well-being pat on the back. It's deeper than that. As Nietzsche, the great thinker, said, he who has a why to life, a why to life, can bear almost any 
how to life. Mark Twain, the American writer, said that the two greatest days in all of our lives are the day we are born and the day we find out why. The purpose of life, the purpose of life, said Albert Schweitzer, is to serve, to show compassion, to help others achieve their purpose. John Kennedy said that efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. We can throw ourselves at the innovative world before us, but unless we know why and who we are, we will be baseless and empty. I want to conclude, maybe that was you telling me to get off. Um, <laughs> I want to conclude with just one poem. I wish it were by a British writer. If I had time, and I don't, I would read you my favorite poem of all life that my father read to my brother and I every single week. Here is the version he read to us. It's called If by Rudyard Kipling. And I, again, I urge you to Google it, get it, and read it. It's a great English statement of what is if only. But this is an American author, Ralph Waldo Emerson, writing in about 1885. He was asked this question, what is success? And this is the question that will dog you through the next 12 months. What is success? from your year here, and this is what he said. To laugh often and much. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and to endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate real beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a little bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. That is to have succeeded. I really wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.